Hello. Okay. It's Lucy Danziger and I'm here with Maya Feller, who's an RD. And Maya is joining us today to talk about heart health and what we should all be eating. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for coming, Maya. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's really nice. I love the fact that on our new crazy world we live in, I get to see where you live or a little bit of your background. So where are we talking to you from today? So you're in my office and I'm going to lean to one side. You can see there's a little sitting chair. There's a nice window with a lamp <clears throat> and, and there's a world. day bed. I'm it. in Brooklyn, New York. Right. Look yeah. Look. And where are you? So I usually live in New York, but I have a house in Bellport, Long Island, and it's a summer house. But since the whole, you know, restriction pandemic, I've been working here a lot and I really enjoy it. It's very zen. It's a snow day. So, and it's February. So it's heart healthy month. And I feel like I'm very much trying to be heart healthy. I'm trying to eat fruits, veggies, nuts. You know, I'm really, really trying, but I get it wrong too. We all need advice. And since you're an RD, let's start with what should we be eating for a heart healthy diet? So usually when I work with patients or people or I talk to anyone, the first thing that I say is let's reframe the conversation and think about the modifications and changes that you can make that are sustainable over time, right? So instead of thinking like you're going to create this huge overhaul of your pattern of eating and your physical activity, what are the small steps that you can do? What are the things that you can add in on a day-to-day -day basis? For example, let's say with some of the foods that we eat, right? So of course, we're always looking for, you know, foods in their whole and minimally processed form with limited added sugar, salts, and fats. And when I'm working with my patients, I say, well, what does that look like? It's going to look different for everyone. But for me this morning, it happened to be, and this is like completely 100% true. It was a small bowl of blueberries, like really, really easy. Um, and I actually have them always in my house, fresh or frozen. They're an excellent source of vitamin C, K, manganese. They also have fiber. And we love all of those vitamins and minerals and nutrients because there's so much good research around them being protective in terms of our cardiovascular health, right? So we wait, wait, love- Wait, let me stop you there because I know we want to talk about specific foods, but can we generalize? Can we- Absolutely. Say vegetables, fruits, like I'm plant-based or I try to be as much as I possibly mm -hmm. be. Um, and, and I want to first talk about sort of the broad strokes. Like, would you say that a plant-based diet is good for health, heart health? And other than staying away from processed foods, I mean, what are the broad strokes people should think about? So the broad strokes are foods in their whole and minimally processed form, right? Okay. So that means like if you eat animal proteins then and you eat chicken, then you're looking for a piece of chicken that has been minimally processed, right? The moment that it goes through a factory, that's your processing. So it could be a chicken breast or a drumstick, and that's in its whole and minimally processed form, as opposed to a piece of chicken that has been slathered in synthetic fats and sugars and salts. So, you, so wait, let me stop you there, because we try to tell people to stay with as much plant-based as they can, right? That's our whole thing. The beat is all about, if you can, try to go as plant-based as possible, which doesn't mean you never have animal protein. It just means that you try to go as plant-based as possible. So for me, my problem with that is potato chips. Potato chips are processed. However, they are plant-based. So one of the things that I think is really important to talk to people about is the fact that if it comes out of a bag, that may not be a good idea. How do you feel about potato chips? So, so I, I rarely, and I'm very, very careful when I talk about nutrition, right? Um, and I talk to people because I recognize that there really is no one size that fits all. And that's why I say, look, if you eat plants or if you don't eat, or if you eat animal proteins, I frame it in that way. Mm -hmm. There are foods, yes, that we know that if you eat them on a regular and consistent basis, you know, things that have lots of additives, added sugars, salts and fats, packaged goods that are ultra processed, that those tend to be the ones that are linked with poor health outcomes. We know that to be true, right? If someone has a diet or a pattern of eating that is really low in fiber, 
uh, if it's really low in, you know, vitamins and minerals, then we're always saying, okay, what's happening on a cellular level, right? What's happening in terms of your metabolism? So I do think, and this is, this, you know, this is truly how I work with my patients. I think that nutrition is a question of what you do the majority of the time, not the standalone moment. So if you have a potato chip from time to time, right? My question is always, how are you eating it, right? Like, are you enjoying it? <laughs> is it causing a lot of stress? Hopefully not. Um, and, you know, what is your condition of health? Like, what's your current health? If you have a non-communicable condition that you're trying to manage, then you think about food from a prescriptive lens as opposed to, you know, uh, a different way, just because that's kind of the reality of what you're dealing with. So I think that, you know, uh, if I were to say to my patients, or if you were to survey my patients or talk to any of them, they'd probably say, you know, Maya works with me to find the pattern of eating that I can sustain over time. And the one that helps me to have the best health outcome. Right. So a little bit of chips is not going to kill me, but uh, exactly <laughs> but back, to, back to the idea of blueberries. One of the things I always say to people, because I was the editor of self for a long time and people would say, is such and such healthy? And I'd always say, compared to what? Like, right, exactly, you know, exactly. Spectrum, right? <laughs> so I always say about blueberries, if you're going to snack on anything, and then you want a sweet, a blueberry is like the perfect snack, right? It's, it's, it's so snackable. Nature's candy, right? I love yeah. it. But, but if you're, let's say, having a dark chocolate moment, or you really can't live without that, fine. But I always say, try to eat the healthiest you, thing you can in any given moment. And what that generally means is, if you're at a food court at an airport, maybe it's a salad. If you're at home, maybe you keep almonds and blueberries around and that's your snack. But basically try to eat the healthiest thing you can at any given moment. And basically that's gonna push you away from the wrong thing and towards the right thing. So if people can keep things around that are healthy, they're gonna have that as an option. So that means when you try to eat the healthiest thing you can at any given moment, if you have blueberries in your house, that's the healthiest thing you can eat in that given moment, right? Yeah, and you, I always too like to put the caveat, especially given the fact that we're in the middle of this moment that none of us have ever lived through, mm -hmm. that you know people have varying degrees of availability, right? So mm -hmm. when we're also thinking about access, it's not just you know finances, but it's like what can you get to, and so. I say it's really the, the thing that you can engage in over time that is that you can replicate, right? So if it's like getting fresh or frozen blueberries, that's fantastic, right? Then you can replicate that behavior, just as you're saying. So it's about creating kind of this framework that is supportive of what it is that you want. Right, I think that's fair. Also, um, you said something really interesting that I think people don't think enough about, which is fiber. And yeah. I think fiber is this magical <laughs> ingredient or substance that, you know, people always thought, oh, fibers for old ladies or fibers for <laughs> regular, whatever. I actually think fiber is the dieter's secret weapon. So do you agree that fiber is important? So, so I think because I work mostly in non-communicable conditions, mm -hmm. I think about fiber from the perspective of reducing systemic inflammation, right? So we know that both soluble and insoluble fiber help to clear cholesterol from the body, right? And we know that when people tend to have better blood lipid profiles, that's better for their cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. We also know that fiber can act as nourishment for those, you know, good bugs that are in your gut, right? And it helps, so it can be like a prebiotic fiber. It can help to kind of make that culture of probiotics, you know, thrive and flourish. And when we think about the gut and we think about health, we know that the gut is the largest immune mediator in the body. And so- People don't know that, by the way. Sorry it's to but people don't yeah. understand that the gut is calling the shots on a lot yeah. of what happens in the other parts of your body, whether it's heart disease, immunity, mood. So I do think that when people think about gut health, sometimes they think it's just my digestive system. That's what I used to think. But right. those bacteria are very, very loud and they talk 
active. They other have things. lots. I call them gremlins. So, <laughs> so I teach uh, nutrition through the life cycle class, and I call them gremlins. I say that they can either be up or down regulated, and they can, you know, be supportive or they can cause some trouble. <laughs> like if there's not enough diversity, it's going to be haywire in there. That's so right. I think, you know, so I think fiber is important for gut health. Also, fiber is really important in terms of helping to keep blood sugars stable and level. Um, and that also has a link to cardiovascular disease. So, you know, when we're thinking about fiber in this big picture and we're thinking about inflammatory processes, it's just so important. And the other thing, Lucy, that's wild in, you know, that we know and we've been saying over and over again, that the majority of the people who are living in the U.S. don't actually meet the recommendations for their daily fiber intake. And right. so they're also not even eating enough fruits and vegetables. And when we're looking at those non-communicable diseases, you see heart disease right up there at the top. So what is, let's just say that you're trying to give people sort of a perfect five foods to add to their plate today. What mm -hmm. would you say those, those foods would be to help meet that dietary requirement of fiber and the, you know, the five fruits and vegetables a day? Right. So the first thing that I would say is feel free to modify anything that I'm saying based on your cultural food ways, your financial situation, your individual likes and dislikes, and your religious dietary pathways. So that's my mm -hmm. overall caveat for everything that I say. Um, because what I love, someone else may be like, Maya, that's not my jam. I think that's uh, really fair though, right? Yeah, totally. So the first thing that I would say, if we're thinking about like a fruit, I would absolutely go for a blueberry. You know, they're healthy, they're delicious, they're really cute, they're gorgeous color. It's very, very, very easy to eat. The next thing that I would definitely say is a nut. Um, I love almonds. I know you said before that you're a huge almond consumer. I absolutely love almonds. Also excellent source of fiber. You get vitamin E, you know, I think that it's wonderful. Uh, so I would say that and almonds. I know that you all are mostly plant-based. I would also say probably from time to time, some type of fish. You know, I do love the omega-3s. And if you don't want to have fish, then I say you can look for the plant-based version. Right. Um, so you could go for a flax, you know, you could even go for uh, some kelp or seaweed in that, you know, in that same vein. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would also say an ancient grain. I love ancient grains. And my, one of my favorites is fonio. Uh, so it cooks really quickly, uh, at, like kind of like couscous. I mean, it's done in like, you, you can't imagine. And it's got the full amino acid profile and it is chock full of fiber. Wait, so can you spell that for me? Because I, I'm not sure I know how to spell that. Fonio. So it's F-O-N-I-O. -O. Fonio. Oh, okay. I think so. I should double check that though, as but, I'm but telling you. Can I get that at my normal market? Because I don't know that everybody would think that. Yeah, so I know Whole Foods carries Fonio. I know that Thrive Market has it. Um, I even, yeah, I, I, so I don't know if they have it at Stop and Shop, for example. Um, but yes, I've, I've seen it around a couple of places. Do you eat it almost like I would eat a rice or a potato or do you put it in salads? So I actually make a breakfast porridge with it. <laughs> And it is incredible. I'm like the queen of mixing things. Um, like, you know, like I'll sit down to uh, vegetables and I'll mix like Brussels sprouts and bok choy and Napa cabbage, you know, like I, I love it all together. Like I like the texture, the flavor, the color. Um, that, that would be my last delicious, thing. By the way. So good. So I like good. cabbage, but I like that kind of, um, that whatever, that almost metallic taste of Brussels sprouts. I love that. Yes, Some me too. Go, yeah. Do you like dandelion greens? I don't really know dandelion greens. So I have to get to know them, huh? You should. They're incredible in terms of a leafy green and they also have great prebiotic fibers in them. They're pretty bitter, uh, but if you can eat what I say, if you can tolerate dirty, which I think that that taste is, mm -hmm. It, you can tolerate it. I usually cut the flavor with um, a Vidalia onion for sweetness. Uh, and sometimes I'll do a little garlic, but usually I just do the olive oil, the Vidalia onion, 
and then the you know dandelion greens and if it's really a bitter batch i'll put some you know aleppo pepper on top of it wow that sounds amazing delicious so what I like about what you're saying is you're making things interesting and creative. And a lot of people think yes. that if you're doing plant-based, it's boring and it's just lettuce and it's rabbit food. But what you're talking about right. is a medley of taste, which I like. Right. Right. Absolutely. I mean, for example, I know everyone's like, oh my gosh, blueberries, like how, like that's predictable. Yeah. But you know, you can have them in so many ways. Like you can make a compote and you can put it on top of your almond flour pancakes. There you go, right? So now you've got something exciting. You can make a barbecue sauce out of it. I mean, there's so many things that you can do to elevate the flavors of the foods that you eat and to also play with the textures. Um, Wait, so we got through four. We'll come back to blueberries in a sec. We got through yeah. four. I wrote down blueberries, almonds, fish, an ancient grain. I'm looking for one number five. Yeah, number five is my leafy greens and it would be a dandelion green. Oh, okay. Dandelion greens. Great. That's great. Now, the reason I want to come back to blueberries that I think is really important, I think that some people who try to lose weight on a keto diet have a phobia about the carbs in fruit. And I've had mm -hmm. this debate both with my training partners who I run and also with people who are super strict. They won't eat grapes. They won't eat blueberries. They won't be, eat anything that's a fruit that's sweet tasting. And I try to mm -hmm. explain to them that the carbs in a high fiber bundle of a blueberry, mm -hmm. the net carbs and, and such are, are that low burning fuel to keep your blood sugar nice and steady. So you don't go, like if you had a donut, you go on a sugar high and a sugar crash and then you're off to the races. You got this roller coaster all day long. But will you explain that in a way? Cause you're the scientist. Tell me why people who are trying to not eat any carbs should not fear fruit and, and blueberries? So the first thing that I usually say, especially when people are engaging in such a low carbohydrate or you know low, low carbohydrate diet is what's the reasoning behind it, right? Um, for patients of mine that are really like they, like, you know, nutrition is a part of patient self-management for their blood sugars then we individualize it to the person. Um, so I'm always really careful, especially in terms of diets, to have an understanding of why the person's engaging in this. And also, you know, when we um, omit certain food groups over time, that we're not causing any kind of deficiency. Now, to your question, when, we, when it comes to fruits like blueberries, remember I said that blueberries are an excellent source of fiber, right? They've got like three just under four grams of fiber um, in a handful or a cup. And if we're thinking about fiber and how it works in terms of helping the body not have a precipitous, like a very sharp spike in their blood sugars, it's really important. Um, also, so, so when you consume fiber, it really slows down how sugar is absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, and when we eat fruits, you know, as a part of a healthy, balanced diet, that type of naturally occurring sugar, in my opinion, is absolutely fine to consume. Um, I also think because it comes with this package of, you know, phytonutrients, and it also comes with this package of, you know, vitamins and minerals, that there's no reason to remove it. Um, because it, it, you know, it, it's, it, yeah, I, I say very clearly, there's no reason to remove it. Also in terms of, you know, fruits in general, um, I know that it's such a controversial topic, Lucy. It's like people, they say like, don't eat fruits, but it's like, they're so good for you, right? And we also know that for the majority of the population living in this country, we're not even meeting the recommended intake. Right. So I would be wary to put out, you know, messaging that says remove blueberries or, you know, um, New fruit. yeah, from right. your pattern of eating. I agree with that. Let's talk about immunity, which is a hot topic for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. So immunity I think people feel that they should go take a supplement, a vitamin D, but they're not paying attention to how food interacts with their immune system or how to bolster up that natural immunity from food. So I know blueberries are chock-a-block with 
that phytochemical that gives it the blue color. But can you talk about the immunity connection? So this, so I'm also very careful with this immunity discussion, mm -hmm. especially right now, because there is no cure for mm -hmm. uh, the common cold. There's no cure for the, you know what I mean? Like there's no cure for the flu. There's no cure for COVID, right? You right. can engage in behaviors that reduce your risk of contracting all of them, um, but there's no magic food cure or supplement cure for of any of it. Uh, and so when we're thinking about, you know, foods in terms of immune health, I usually steer clear of singling out an individual food um, mm. and say that it's much more about an overall pattern of eating as well as where your body is in that moment, right? So if you have high cholesterol, well, that's definitely linked to how your immune system functions, right? So there is a stressor that's happening internally. And so that will have an impact on your immune system's functioning. So I really think about it in, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So I've heard about that there is a, at least a uh, association of a link between high cholesterol and the worst symptoms of COVID. And we're careful too. I make sure that I never say, that you can prevent COVID. You cannot mm -hmm. prevent COVID. But if you do get a virus, if you catch an infection, you will have a better chance of having fewer severe symptoms if your body is healthy to start out, right? That, hopefully, that hopefully, can, hopefully, hopefully, right. hopefully, right. hopefully. You know, hopefully. Talk to people who have terrible luck with this. Right. But I do think that the best thing we can do is try to get sleep, get exercise, watch some funny TV or de-stress. However, you know, for me, it's take my dog for a walk and eat the healthiest diet you could possibly find. And that means lots of fruits and vegetables. So, yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, so like what I've been saying to uh, people that I work with is just as you said, try to find time to get out every single day. You know, I have some patients that live in urban settings that are quite population dense. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's logistics around getting outside. Mm -hmm. um, I also talk to my patients about the importance of finding what I refer to as, as visual relief. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's this idea like, you know, I live in the city and when I only see the city for too long, Mm -hmm. then it's like, I feel like I'm crunchy around the edges and my patients say the same thing, right? So it's like, where can we go to get visual relief? And it doesn't have to be expensive. Mm -hmm. New York, it's an island. You can go to Brighton Beach and you'll get some great visual relief looking out at the ocean. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah. I talk about that. Um, By the way, I go to Central Park. Yes. I yes. mean, any park, but I'm saying the beauty of New York is that there are these communal designed areas where we as city dwellers have that luxury where we can go right. walk in prospect park central park down by right. the the brooklyn promenade it has exactly. been designed for us to take advantage of that and so, right. you know i always say to my kids when i was little in a snowstorm my father would literally bundle us up and take us to the park and just say play and it yeah. was freezing cold out, but we were made to go outside. And I, I, exactly. I've always felt that that was really, really mentally healthy. I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing too, in terms of thinking about creating a pattern of eating that's truly nourishing, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, there was this article last year and I can't remember the exact statistics, but it was some high number of people who felt guilty around consuming food. And so, you know, this may be like, you know, <laughs> A, a sweet thought, but it's really how I believe, what, how I operate and how I counsel is like, let's remove the guilt from consuming food and let's think about it as something, you know, that is nourishing. Um, yes. And but let's I think about think it's, it's that bacteria thing. I just did a story on this that I think is so fascinating. The bacteria that you grow in your gut depends a lot on what you eat, right? Mm -hmm, so absolutely. One of the new pieces of information that I just took in, which you may or may not agree with, is those bacteria, the bacteria, whatever, microbiome is talking to your brain and your brain's talking to your microbiome. So if you crave cookies, chips, and junk food, and mm -hmm. you give into that craving, which is fine sometimes, chances are that bacteria that you grow that munches on all the junk food 
is going to tell your brain, I want some more of that. Whereas mm -hmm. if you eat, let's say I have some spinach salad that's sitting there that I haven't eaten in days, but after this conversation, let's say I go eat that spinach salad, your body, that gut microbiome that munches on that spinach is going to get hungry again and say, you know, I really like that. Can you give me some more fruits and veggies? Because that's what I thrive on. So if mm -hmm. you actually can get yourself on a pattern where you're eating healthy foods, you're going to crave more healthy foods as opposed to if you eat a lot of junk food, you're going to crave more junk food. And I think that's a really, really interesting goal for people if they can just try to create a pattern of healthy eating, what they're going to want more of is blueberries, is an orange, is a salad, is something that, that feeds the body in a way that makes you feel nourished. You said nourished and I went yeah. off on a tangent. Yeah, no, but you know, I, I, so it's, I think that is the discussion in nutrition and wellness that we're all having, right? So mm -hmm. how is it that we can help people engage in patterns of eating that honor their cultural food ways and also help them to express health in a beneficial manner. Uh, easier said than done, because in this moment where we are all under more stress and duress than normal, right? Where procuring food has become like, you know, a second project for many. The, you know, let's be honest, food is unbelievably expensive right now. Mm -hmm. The other day I saw a cucumber that was $6 and it was a conventional cucumber. Mm -hmm. And I wondered as a dietitian, I was like, oh my goodness. I said, well, if I say that this is an expensive venture, what's happening out there, you know what I mean, in the rest of the world. And right. so I think that as we're making these recommendations in 2021 and beyond, it's like, how do we help people to not feel bad about access Right. And, and patterns that have been kind of, a, you know, that patterns that they've developed and to find these modifications and kind of like new pathways with foods that are also tasty and delicious. Right. So I agree with that. Rather, mm -hmm. Can I just bring up a counter thought? So yes. a lot of the problems and misperceptions about plant-based diets is that they're super expensive. That's what people right. call the goop factor or whatever you want to call it. That's mm -hmm. a perception that, you know, it's- And it's, I love goop, by the way, just so you know. Me too, me too. <laughs> I'm a huge fan, huge fan. Can't afford their sweaters, but okay. So I will say this. We did a study or we published a story about a study that says if you cut out meat um, and cheese, your grocery bills will be less. Mm -hmm. And that if you're- um, eating, you know, rice and beans, it's, it can be inexpensive. So one thing I don't want to do is make people feel that they shouldn't invest in themselves, which is not to say let them eat cake. That sounds like disingenuous. If you mm -hmm. actually are unemployed right now and, you know, you're worried about the rent, there's stress, right? Mm -hmm. But I do feel like if you go and eat a bag of chips or junk food, chances are your mood's going to crash and you're mm -hmm. going to end up feeling pretty down. Whereas if you can afford to eat a healthy meal, whether that's you know a salad, rice and beans, whatever you want to call it, that is going to help create a more uplifting effect in your body. And I feel that if we can somehow break the pattern of eating junk food, it will also help us feel more positive and nourished in a way that is healthy and energized. Right. And, you know, and that's a very touchy argument to have because, you know, dollar meals are junk food, right? So it's a very tough argument to have, but I do know that meat's expensive and I do know that cheese is expensive. Yeah. And I know that grains are not. Right. And, and Lucy, this, I, so I think what you're saying is absolutely right. I think there are a couple of other layers too, that we see in nutrition where it's like, you need the utensils and the tools to prepare. You need some health literacy and know-how. Yes. Because it, so I remember years ago, the first time I, so my husband's Swiss. And the first time I went with him to Switzerland, I remember his mom made this huge salad. And the salad had fresh herbs and seasoning on it. Now, I'm a huge lover of greens and always have been. 
Um, like I will eat a salad for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'll put things in salads like, you know, blueberries, like, you know, I, I will put like all sorts of pickles and you name it in there. And when I say pickles, I mean like jalapenos and things like that, right? So I love a salad and I've always loved a salad, but I had never had a seasoned salad. And when I came back to New York, I said, well, why are we not doing this? Why are we not seasoning and loving up our salads the way that you know, he was my boyfriend at the time, my husband's now, now his mm -hmm. mom had done. And, and it's so funny. I only see that in certain types of restaurants. I, right. I, I agree. I mean, we did a whole story, um, with a woman who said, you know, the first time she saw eight different types of salad, she got a, she got a job at D'Agostino and realized, oh my right. God, more than just iceberg lettuce. This right. is a, an argument we need to have across the whole spectrum, politically, yeah. like Mark Biven will say, yeah. the government subsidizes junk food and we need to subsidize healthy food. 100%. And Eric, sorry, yeah, and Eric Adams has written a book about you know, healthy at last, yeah. and about you know, how he grew up in a place where junk food was you know, served and then he had diabetes and changed his diet, became plant-based and changed his health fate. So this is an uphill battle. There is no question, there is work to do. We need to start with people just buying nuts, blueberries, greens, and feeding it to themselves and deciding, maybe I feel better on that. Like that, it's just right. a, it's like a personal experiment on everybody's you know, behalf to say, how can I be he heart healthier? Let me just try it. Yes, it, I, I love the idea of exploration, right? I always say, you know, to my patients, what if we were to say, let's try one new, you know, fruit or vegetable each month. Um, and, and, and I mean, I am the person that I have purchased things that I don't even know what they are. And I'll post a picture and I'll say, does anyone know what this is? And pre COVID, I would go knocking on my neighbor's door and be like, have you ever seen this? <laughs> what is this? What am I supposed to do with it? And I mean, wild, so wild things. So um, I love that idea too. I wanted to start a column like that. There's a place out here called Junta's Meat Farm, which has this amazing produce section. And they have like things shaped like stars and things yeah. with little pricklies on them yeah. and things that are shaped very tropical looking fruits that yeah. probably, you know, I've never tried. And I'm like, this is so cool. There's so much out there that I don't even know what it tastes like. I want to try it. Yeah. But again, I'm, you know, lucky enough to be able to drive to that place and get that produce. So right. I'm not acting as if that is everyone's experience, right? Exactly. We have real food deserts, right? Right. But well, that's right. And I think that's right. Sorry, Lucy. I think no, what you just said is that the, that the experiences with nutrition are so um, varied within this country, but the through line is that people are not able for a multitude of reasons to meet the recommendations and the question is, how do we come up with clear, enticing, sexy messaging to get people to take one step toward trying that new thing, incorporating that new pattern or style of eating into their overall, right? So it's not, I mean, it really, in my opinion, it's like, it's not starting with the overhaul. It's saying, oh, is there one meal in the week that I could make that is based in plants, right? And is there one modification that I can make, like trying a new ancient grain or, you know what I mean? And making it in bulk so that it's affordable and seasoning it well so that it's delicious, right? And then- so One of the things Bittman said, which I love, is start with kids. Like if you want America to eat healthier in 20 or 40 years, start with a little kid, right? So let's say we're talking about blueberries, most people have a blender. Most people have some kind of mixer or blender, right? So what if you go to the store and buy all sorts of things to put in that blender? You've got your blueberries and maybe you have your greens and you've got your ice and maybe you have your almond milk or something like that. I think kids love to eat what they make. Like my kids would always be like, I want to make the pancake and I want to eat the pancake. Yep. And it's like, okay. So you, you know, get them to try creating some kind of a smoothie with all sorts of you know healthy ingredients and have them taste each other's smoothies. And it's like, well, my smooth, smoothie is blue because there are blueberries and mine is green because there's kale or whatever. Yeah. I think that's really fun. I mean, I think th this whole idea of taking guilt out of it and making food joyful and making it healthy and making it a family sort of activity that everybody sees like, 
my husband gets involved and then he's like, well, who can make the healthiest breakfast? And I'm like, you win. So I, mean, I think <laughs> if there's a way to make it upbeat and fun. I think we're going to win. I do. I will tell you that my daughter and I love to do an almond flour pancake with fresh blueberries in there. Um, and she is the biggest fan. She loves that. Sometimes I'll even use like almond or coconut flour. Um, I even use a little chickpea flour and I'll make a muffin. And she also loves when I put blueberries in there. I mean, so. so share that recipe with me. Okay, absolutely. If you don't I mind. Will. Also, yeah, can definitely. you do it without dairy? We try to do yeah. it without dairy. Yeah, definitely. Okay, definitely. Great. Thank you. Because as we are trying to get people to eat plant-based and obviously the beat is for everybody, but yeah. if they come to us for the plant-based option, I would love to do an almond flour pancake with blueberries where you use, I don't know, something other than an egg, you know, flaxseed, yeah. whatever you can do. Yeah, 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 totally. So you actually, I actually use banana. I mean, we, it's funny, I talk about animal proteins, but my son is vegetarian and we're low, like I, I'm lactose intolerant. So I consume lactose-free milk myself, you know, and like a, some, yeah. like sometimes dairy, but so most of the food that I make actually ends up being uh, accidentally vegan. And so everyone well, thinks that I'm vegan. I think a lot of people are, are lactose intolerant and they don't know it. Um, yeah. Right, oh, yeah. You're about to lose our Zoom because we're on Zoom. But thank you, Maya, for everything. And um, send me your recipe. And Absolutely. we will also link to your site where people can sign up for sessions with you if they want to. Oh, incredible. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank Enjoy you the so day. Much. Thank you. I hope we get to meet in person someday. Yeah, I hope so too. Okay, take care. Thanks for everything. Bye. Bye. Bye.